I get so passionate about it. I get so angry, you know, because there's this saying like, oh, can you beat him in a hook? Can you beat, man, win, win, that's it. Just win and don't talk to me about anything else. You believe the match is finished. And I wonder if that gets in the head of the other person. You see this? Yeah. Quit. The following is a conversation with Devin Larratt, considered by many to be one of the greatest arm wrestlers in history. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast. To support it, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, dear friends, here's Devin Larratt. You are considered to be one of the greatest arm wrestlers in history, plus are one of the most charismatic and uh, fun people to watch in arm wrestling. But let me first uh, start with a ridiculous, the controversial opinion. I actually really enjoy Over the Top, the movie oh. with uh, Sylvester Stallone, where he's a trucker. It's like a father-son movie. It's, uh, you know, like a, a bunch of sports have the definitive movie. You know, boxing has... Rocky, maybe folk style, collegiate wrestling has uh, Vision Quest. Um, what else is there? Billiards has Color of Money. Yeah, This is uh, the sort of movie for arm wrestling. So what did Over the Top get right? What did it get wrong about arm wrestling? That was actually based off of a real story. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah, the Over the Top movie, I mean, to a certain degree, that's actually real life. Like that tournament over the top was real. Yeah. It was literally named over the top. Yes, yes. There was a trucker division and the guy actually won a truck for real. His name's John Brzezink. You know who that is, mm -hmm. right? So the actual over the top tournament, the trucker division was won by John. Who is John Brzezink? He, he is, a lot of people talk about him as like a legend and uh, one of, if not the greatest arm wrestlers of all time. John Brzezink is every arm wrestler's father to a certain degree all of us um the entire sport looks up to him uh he <laughs> it's incredible what he's done i mean at 18 he won over the top at 57 he just competed with me a couple months ago still at the world level 18 that's that's 40 years of being at the top of a sport it's incredible. Uh, he's hailed as the greatest of all time in the sport of arm wrestling. Um, yeah. And he doesn't, he's beaten some monsters. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he doesn't. <laughs> I mean, when you talk about like the, uh, the evolution of the sport, he's responsible for so much of it. Like when you talk about like a lot of times when you go back like 20 years, 30 years, a lot of us looked at arm wrestling I think it's, I mean, as something you could kind of do. And he's the first guy who's like, if you want to get better at arm wrestling, you got to arm wrestle. And it seems so simple, but, um, you know, he answered so many questions that all of us had about techniques in the sport, um, back, you know, pre-video pre, pre -video internet. Um, yeah, he's everybody, he's been everybody's target for like 40 years. <laughs> so in terms of strength, in terms of power, in terms of skill, what did he teach the sport of arm wrestling? So if you look, how, how did the sport change from 80s, 90s to uh, the aughts? You were at the top of the world for many years, you know, um, you, I, many argue you're still at the very top of the world, but like you were very dominant, both left and right hand in, uh, I don't know, 2008 to 2013, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, so how does that sport evolve to today? So it's hard for me to comment, you know, prior to, you know, when I came to the sport was kind of mid nineties. Like I've been arm wrestling my whole life, but uh, I wasn't really involved in the sport to a, a major degree until probably, you know, mid nineties. Um, but I'll say that before the mid nineties, it was really hard to get good at arm wrestling. Very difficult. Um, everybody was doing it wrong, really. <laughs> like it was really rare to find people who were technically good arm wrestlers. Um, it was very underground. You know, when I when I got into sport, it was a flyer that came in the mail. Uh, you had to know somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, and then you go to a club and you can't do anything with these people. And and they and they knew how to arm wrestle. They did, but real masters were rare. And, you know, then internet 
internet helped everybody. Communication, uh, the transfer of knowledge became so much faster. Um, people became technically, you know, invested. People started train, sharing, sharing ideas. By I'd say, two thousand and well, probably around the turn of the millennia, I'd say that professional leagues started to slowly pick up. More organized, uh, bigger productions started to attract more athletes. More people took it seriously. By 2010, I'd say there was another jump, um, more serious leagues, a little bit more money. By 2015, more major media, like people were investing a lot of money, like, uh, you know, millionaires, billionaires type of people were organizing events, setting up leagues. And um, yeah, I mean, the past five years, it's just blown up. Uh, the techniques, I mean, if if I was to go back to when I started, uh, you know, what t what took me 10 or 15 years to learn, I mean, new guys are showing up and they've got it down in like a year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing about it, the, the development of the sport is it's, like I was telling you off mic, it's a battle of one versus one. Yeah. And then it, that can turn into battle of nations, which, you know, there is, there's Canada, there's the United States, there's all the Eastern Europe, Russia, Georgia, all of that. Yeah. Th that that's what makes some of the greatest sports in Olympics great, like weightlifting. It's a battle of nations, not just a battle of individuals. And it's almost like these two humans represent the two nations. And I see that very much. We'll talk about your matches coming up, but there is um, that battle between North America and that other part of the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> North America is very prized. You know, the North American champion is always highly sought after because they're typically the most famous. You know, even still when, you know, quite arguably, there's always somebody in Eastern Europe who's just monstrous. Uh, it's typically the North American athlete who's more recognized. By the way. Oh, yeah. We'll have a cup here with some maple syrup. Cheers, Lex. Cheers. Cheers. We should, should probably show. You, you just down that whole thing. No, no, no. I'm going to sip it. I'm going to sip it, you know. But by all means. It's that really good, delicious. right? Yeah. yeah. That is uh, maple syrup. Yeah. That's a uh, perfect July day from mm. Canada in a bottle. Yeah. So you're uh, on a on a totally uh, on a total tangent. You are known for appreciating food in all kinds of ways, but one of the things you're known for is pancakes. Uh, that is uh yeah, that's gone to a crazy place in the sport, but yeah, like <laughs> Where did uh, that originate? So, um where that originated. When it went from like your actual love for pancakes yeah. to the meme. <laughs> yeah. So so I think what happened was uh um so I had a match with Michael Todd. Big match. Uh Michael, great champion. Um he's another guy who's, you know, he's never gonna get off the horse. Uh, you know, he's uh Jesus his elbow is a complete disaster. <laughs> um probably one of the most loved and hated guys in the sport right now. Um, is it because of the King's move? That we yeah. About? One of the yeah, the King's move brings him a lot of hate. Um, not from me, not from a lot of people, but um, a lot of observers have a, a big problem with the King's move. What's uh, wrong with being a little bit controversial? That's fun. You know, I get so passionate about it. I get so angry, you know, because there's this saying like, oh, can you beat him in a hook? Can you beat, man, win. Yeah. Win. That's all that matters. That's it. Just win and don't talk to me about anything else. Yeah. If you can win with style, win with style. But don't talk to me about anything but winning. Other, it's, it's, That's the priority. So you had this match with Michael Todd. Yeah. So I was in a terrible place. Um, I guess it was, I get so screwed up with the years. It's 2022 now, right? No, it's 2030. What are you talking about? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. I think it is actually 2030. We're way ahead of schedule. Yeah. Oh man. That's right. So when was this? This was like a decade ago or no? No, this is uh like a year and a bit ago. So, oh, this is very recent. Very recent. Yeah. Okay. So I got really sick. Is that I, the match? Yeah, this is the match, right? Okay. Awesome match. Uh 
So this is this match is for the Legacy Hammer. So we invented this thing called the Legacy Hammer, and Michael took it from me in, I think, 2018. Mm -hmm. And then COVID shut everything down, and Michael went overseas to try and set up, because at that time, Nor Michael was a North American champion. He beat me, and he went to Dubai, and he organized this great big match with Levon. And the whole thing fell apart. Organizers, leagues, wouldn't let it happen, but the there was still an ability to have a match of significance happen. So Michael's like, "Who do you want?" And I'm like, "Let's give Devin a rematch." And I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> yes!" And I was really sick at the time. Uh, I had DVT, I had pulmonary embolism, I was mentally in a terrible place, and I got offered the match, and I just totally turned my life around, and I committed really hard yeah and uh what happened in this match by the way oh i just totally destroyed him <laughs> yeah i just beat the piss out of him yeah um michael's a good friend of mine but uh yeah there's a lot of camaraderie yeah and you guys talked afterwards it's yeah. great but we fight like like brothers you know like so we let each other really fight hard against each other but so i was I knew, I mean, strength and mass, they go hand in hand. And I committed to just getting as big and as strong as I could. And literally I was eating pancakes every day. Bacon, pancakes, every sloppy bit of garbage food I could eat. I was trying to eat healthy also, but if there was garbage food, I'd eat it. What well, you mean bacon and pancakes isn't healthy? What are you talking about? Exactly. Uh, oh, but people exactly. should go watch, there's a video where you make like the, the Canadian, <laughs> meal of um, bacon with some bacon cooking tips yeah. water that was interesting yeah and then um and then obviously pancakes and maple syrup all over the whole thing yeah <laughs> yeah you're making me very hungry Lex. <laughs> i i've caused more diabetes than uh you know probably gonna get in trouble karmically for making the world obese you should probably write a like like a book the pancake diet yeah Devin Larratt. yeah i think i will do that one day so you said uh mass and strength go hand in hand just at a big level about arm wrestling, what's more important? Strength, power, endurance, skill, strategy, or mental toughness? Like, what, how do these components all come into play in arm wrestling? They're, they're all important. You can use everything and you can adjust your strategy based off of the tools that you have. Uh, I would say if I, I could pick ever just one thing to have more of, uh, I would I would say that it would be strength gained while fighting, while actually arm wrestling. So yeah. not off the off the table. no no no. So you get stronger from arm wrestling. How do you get stronger from arm wrestling? Like in jujitsu and grappling, you can get good by training with people much uh, technically worse than you. So white, with white belts and blue belts, yeah, it's actually beneficial. Agree, because you get to work stuff out. Right, but I wouldn't say it develops like that intensity and power required to go against um, people at your level. So what, how do you balance that? Do you, is it okay to go against people that are much weaker than you? Or um, do you really have to go against people at the same level? I, I think that a blended strategy is probably the best. Um, I, I'd say kind of a rule is whatever you do, you get better at, right? So. You want to be kind of as precise as possible. You don't want to get hurt, um, and it's just about investment. And the answer is not always the same. Things are going to change. Uh, I am currently a big believer in what I call tower building. Right, so it, it, you have to do a lot of volume to build a great tower. You you need to have a ton a ton of volume. So so when you look at how to best build volume, you want to do workouts that aren't particularly challenging, that make you feel good, and do them so that when you add them all together, you, you get the biggest number. So many easy workouts a day that are specific as possible, in my opinion, is the best way to lay the foundation for an extreme peak. And, Precision, right? Like there's no more precise way to get strong at arm wrestling than arm wrestle. 
So how often can you arm wrestle? What's your training regimen? You, you're ta you've talked about this as the climb. Right. What is the training process to get great at arm wrestling? Well, again, it's gonna depend on what level you're at. Um, the answer at the beginning might not be the same. For me, a guy who's been doing it almost 30 years, I have to harvest. I have to harvest energy from clubs. Um, I call it cosmic punch. Sorry uh, to interrupt, you were here in Austin, Texas. You are in Austin, Texas, but you were at the, what was it called? The the water, water tank. tank, yeah. And you had an awesome crowd. It I was to, great. I get to watch, I get to interact with a lot of those guys. Um, yeah. Just just amazing community, amazing human beings. I got to talk to Dimitri in Russian and in English. He's a, he's an engineer, his wife is an engineer, so he's a brilliant dude, but also, uh, one of the toughest, I guess, guys you face there. Yeah. But you faced, I don't know how many people. It must have been hundreds of <laughs> yeah, matches. Yeah, so the bar was full. Yeah, and that, that for me is a perfect training scenario. Yeah. So if I go in and just kind of be, I'm like a lightning rod, and I just absorb everything that I can get from people, you know, all their effort, uh, that's perfect. That's perfect. But I'm lucky because I'm in a place that I can handle it. You know, if I was losing or failing, this would not be optimal. Mm -hmm. But because I'm I'm strong enough, I've been doing it long enough that I can kind of absorb it without damaging me, this is perfect. This is perfect. I typically when I'm training up for a very serious match, I'll try and do that uh 3 or 4 times a week. And then the days in between, I will just do blood flow rehab, blood flow rehab. I will never hit a PR, a record. I'll never do it anymore. I don't do it. I used to, a lot of things change. And that's why I say like, there's a lot of ways to do it. This is currently a system that's working very well for me. So when you say PR, you're not aggressively chasing a peak. You're just building and building and building. Yeah. My only peak that I care about is for this cycle, the 25th of June. That's my only PR. Let's talk about the 25th of June. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about Levan Siganishvili, yeah. the Georgian Hawk. Yeah. Uh, question number one, is it possible to beat him? He is widely acknowledged as uh, the most powerful person in arm wrestling today. Is he beatable? Yeah, and if so, every, how? Everybody's beatable. Everybody's beatable. Levon is incredible. He's uh, he is what this modern peak of arm wrestling represents. So, for people who are just listening, we we also have an overlay of a video of Levon going against Vitaly Ledin, um, another top three person in the world, perhaps. Yeah. In, in arm wrestling. Yeah. And the uh, uh, Levon is the guy on the right, just big. <laughs> I love it. And the the aggression, uh, I mean, actually sort of underneath it all is it, it seems to be a teddy bear, but when, when he turns it on, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's raw power. He's the full package. Levon is, uh, he represents the pinnacle. Um, there's Dennis in the background. <laughs> He's like, I wanna be back in there. <laughs> yeah. Levon has a lot of bases covered. Uh, he's, I mean, he's curling 300 pounds with one arm. I mean, the strength that he shows for arm wrestling is 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 so far ahead of the field. It's, it's very, very strong. Um, but it's absolutely possible. It's absolutely possible. The one thing that I'm confident about, well, I'd say there's two things. The two things I'm confident about is that I have more experience than he does. And experience counts for a lot. The other thing is uh, my ability to breathe and recover. So if ever there's an opportunity for the tide to turn, that's I think where he'll never get it back. So I think if I can somehow find a hole in his game, then uh, yeah. <laughs> so you, you want to hold off the initial like assault of power and that and then wear him out and to find the hole and then 
So, so how much of that is mental? How much of it is just the physical ability to do for your muscles to have the endurance to hold off? I like to make the sport bigger. And a lot of things that most arm wrestlers um, believe the sport is, I always try and push those boundaries. So there is definitely a mental aspect to it when you're faced with something that you've never seen before. That's when things like experience comes in. He can become surprised where what's a surprise for him is routine for me. So my adjustments will be more precise, more accurate. Um, yeah, that's how I get in. That's how I get in. Yeah, I play a, I play a dirty game. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so some of it. Uh, how mu how important is confidence in the whole in, in the progression of the match? Is there ups and downs of confidence? Like holy shit, I actually have a chance to win this. Holy shit, I'm winning this. You're done. There's uh, some of my favorite moments. I don't know if those are fake or not in terms of your expressions. If it fake it until you make it, but whenever you shake your head or whatever, it you, you make it apparent that. You believe the match is finished. And I wonder if that gets in the head of the other person. <laughs> when you start to actually, uh, so I'm sure you're doing things in like precise detailed things with your hands to also indicate that you believe they're finished, but you're facially just- you see this? Yeah. Quit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's right, because it's facing <laughs> the other. <laughs> So yeah. that's ultimately what the battle is about. It's like, it, it's, you're done. It's, you might as well give up. Commitment is so important in anything that you do, right? Like um, I always kind of try and bring things to uh, a level of commitment that's uncommon. I, I think that that's a lot of reasons why I do well. It's because I just get so committed in the whole process. And by the time that I actually show up to fight, I sometimes just wish that they would kill me, you know? I, I wish that they would because that's what, that's how far I wanna go. Like mm -hmm. people talk about like how committed are you to the match? Like if you're committed to the match and you lose, you should be hurt. Yeah. Like that's, I'm, I'm often unhappy when I lose a match and, and I don't have an injury. I'm like, damn, I'm like what the fuck? Like I should have, like I feel, I feel like I didn't commit, you know? Um, uh, I don't know if you know who Dan Gable is the wrestler. He Oh yeah, uh, he was on uh he was on the podcast? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh he he talked about his whole career he dreamed of working so hard that he gets he can't get off the mat right. by by himself. Yeah. And he was always dis he's disappointed ultimately at the end of his career because he was always able to get off the mat on his own accord. So he wants to yeah, leave it all uh, on the mat just from exhaustion. So that that's what commitment looks like. Yeah. But what what is this process? What is this climb for? Probably the toughest match of your career. I would say the most epic match in in arm wrestling history. I mean, it's really building up. You are the you said North America. That's a. I mean, I think, um, by accounts of many, you're one of the greatest arm wrestlers ever. He is one of the scariest arm wrestlers ever. And so this match, uh, by the way, where is it happening? It'll be in Dubai. In Dubai. Yeah. June. So what does the climb look like? The climb for me, um, what I have to change in my life always, um, people talk about being a professional. I've always loved the sport. I've, I've loved it like crazy. Uh, but to me, the path is about simplicity and removal of distractions. Um, the, I do better and better the more I get rid of everything, nothing else, um, so that my life is just the goal, just the target, and everything else is off the table. And that's, that's where I need to get to, um, where there's nothing, there's nothing between me and him. And every single day you're putting in the volume. Every day, all day. Now you said you worked out, so you, yesterday you did hundreds of arm wrestling yeah. matches, and then today you said in the morning you still worked out, so yeah. what was that workout? So you, you're mixing up stuff where you're doing weights? Uh, 
Also, uh, this morning, you know, I, I try to really focus on what's administratively easy. Uh, that's a big part of it for me with everything I do. So I just travel with bands. Yeah, I got bands with me and it's rehabilitative in nature. So I'm really focusing on blood flow, uh, feeling good, doing proper movements. But yeah, just a uh, band workout in the hotel. Room. What does a band workout look like? So are you doing the, the arm wrestling movement? Are you doing oh, see that? See, see what you did there? What's that? <laughs> Yeah, it's you, that have, you want to bring them in. Yeah, <laughs> like up, up. Oh, the up, up thing. Up, up, up into your center, right? Yeah. You think what can you control out here? No, you bring everything close. You want every just that's it. Don't worry about that's pinning. It. Pinning happens once it's close to you. Yeah, yeah. The pinning is. People always think about pinning. You don't think about pinning. How much of the body is a part of this too? Like the, uh, the core. The torso, because it feels like there's that almost like a Mike Tyson punch power, right? Yep. Does it come from the hips too, and the the legs? It it's just is it's the whole body. The thing? whole body. It's definitely the whole body. Like everything is working. Uh, you're connected to the table at times, as far as your base. Sometimes your base is your feet, but a lot of times you can base off the table. So, yeah. so you can base off your hips. But I'll tell you, no arm wrestler cares about doing squats. <laughs> no arm wrestlers doing planks. Yeah. Okay. It's all about the forearm and the actions of the hand. Yeah. Uh, that's always the limiting factor. You look at a guy like Oleg Zok. Okay. Do you know this guy? Oleg Zok. He's yeah, yeah, yeah. Marvelous. He's a he's a total hellboy. He's my inspiration to what I call pumpkin training. But um, what's pumpkin training? Uh, probably we'll get into that. But I only train my right arm. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with homework. But back to full body, it is full body. My my good friend, Matt Mask, when he arm wrestled me, he actually blew his internal abductor in his, in his leg. Mm -hmm. So yeah, people walk away from tournament, their calves can be sore sometimes, you know, it happens. But no, oh, there he is right there. Yeah, yeah. oh, like he's, he is a real life hellboy. <laughs> he's like, he's like 170 pounds there. <laughs> Look at his arm. Look at his uh -huh. arm. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, he's totally crazy. But that's you doing left right there. So that's, by yeah. the way, Levon, you're going right. Yeah. Yeah. So can you say more about the, the mental side? Are you visualizing what it takes to beat him? Are you trying to get in his head? Um, All of these things. So do you think I, it's possible to get in his head? <laughs> um, there's definitely strategies that you can do depending on who it is you're facing. Uh, it's very good to know who it is you're fighting and choose the correct strategy mentally. Uh, but I always follow a process when it comes to my mental preparation. When I'm far away from an event, I just always build up my opponent, build them, I build them, I respect them, I, to a point where I almost start to fear them mm. and start to believe that they'll beat me. And this is a very vital part of my preparation. And that's where I am right now with Levon. I don't, I just build him up, build him up into this thing that scares me. Um, and it forces me to be responsible, you know, uh, cause I don't want to lose, you know, I, I want to win. Um, uh, so the greater my opponent, the greater I can build their worth in my mind, the more motivation it gives me. Um, then there comes a point when, uh, when it changes and, then I start to degrade them. And uh, yeah, that's when it normally starts to get fun. And uh, normally by the time I face them, uh, I just try and completely dominate from every interaction from start to finish. Uh, yeah. When uh, in the actual moment of the match, like in, in the moments leading up to it, what's the feeling? Is it uh, fear? Is it confidence? Anxiety? What What's going through your mind? I love to fight. I love it. Uh, lo I always have. I uh, there's there's every day um, where you have you know the distractions of life, and then there's really living in the moment, right? And it's whatever you love to do, and that's when you can you know really be free. Uh, I, I'm free when I'm fighting, right? So you put me in that good fight and I just love it. 
and I don't think about the past. I don't think about the future. I just think about killing that dude in front of me, and I enjoy that. <laughs> and just being intensely in the moment. Just that's just, it. Just right there, just fighting as hard as I can. Do you study the opponent? Like, do you st have you for this particular match? Do you study videos of Levon? I've seen everything. I've read everything. I get opinions from other people. I watch very closely. Yeah. What do you make of his evolution? So, so he's he's grown in size, but also you've talked about his, um, you know, evolution technically as well. Mm -hmm. What in studying him since we're in the uh, build your opponent mm -hmm. to be terrifying stage. Yeah. Uh, what uh, what makes him great? He's very impressive. The 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 greatest thing about him is is his strength. That's the thing that sets him apart from everyone. Uh, his strength, specialized strength, exact strength for arm wrestling, I believe it's unmatched. Can we just uh, linger on that word strength? Mm -hmm. What does strength mean? What does it feel like? Are we talking about um, bicep? like shoulder, are we talking about like whatever controls right. this, the wrist? Yeah. Is it the, what, where, what, how does strength manifest? You yeah. know, like when I touch your hand, when, when we grab arms, I feel like, fuck, that's strong. <laughs> There's control, right? What is that feeling? Well, where does that come from? Where in arm wrestling, when you're at the top of the world, where does that come from? So it's chains, there's chains of strength. And in arm wrestling, this is like technical strength. Okay, and we use these technical chains to fight each other. Uh, the the chains that I'll talk about is so you'll talk. Remember how we talked about the post, mm -hmm. this upwards drive, this ability to close this angle. This is a chain. Um, it can be used. It's it's a technical attack. It's also an attack that can be built with with training. Just the ability to just drive upwards. Uh, there's a chain where you cup right, cup mm -hmm. your wrist in cup your wrist in and the, and the anchor and the chain brings you right to your heart, right to your center, right? Mm -hmm. This chain, and this can be done at any time. Uh, there's a pronation chain and that's, that's to turn your thumb over, right? Turn your thumb over and you attack the person's cupping chain. And there's a huge number of muscles involved in each of right. those chains. And that's why I say it's a chain, right? But they're movements and these movements you can develop in the gym or through practice. So you don't mean, so it's easy to sort of interpret strength to mean the the cur how much you curl, essentially. Yeah. But it's, you mean the chain, it's all has right. to do and with- Right, and that's the, like, I mean, people talk, is it a bicep? I mean, yes, there's bicep for sure involved, but I, I'll always be inaccurate if I try and tell you like what muscles are the, so I prefer to explain it in a movement and then everything that's involved to do that movement, right? Yeah, and Levon's movements, for arm wrestling are incredibly impressive. What do you attribute to, how much of that is genetics? How much of it is some training thing he's doing? I think that Levon is very special in terms of his genetics. Like not everybody can be Levon, you know? Yeah. There's, there's not many Levons out there. Um, but, what I've encountered and the bias that I always see, like when people talk about people like Levon, they discount the other side so very quickly. And the thing is, Levon rarely has to show the other side because he's so far ahead. You talk about the technical application of the sport, he so rarely needs to show it, mm -hmm. but he's clearly incredible. If you watch his progression, he came up having very, difficult technical struggles to overcome. Georgia is a great country for arm wrestling. Like there's this guy, Gennady Kvikvinia, who no one would ever say is not technical. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it took him years to defeat him to a point where now it's not, it's not even a discussion. Yeah, you talk about the progression. They had a lot of battles together over the years. Yeah. It's fascinating to see the tides turn. Oh yeah, and once they've turned, it's like <laughs> completely, completely different level. Yeah, I mean, he's got he's got strength, he's got technique. Some people will argue that his technique is flawed at times. They've shown matches where he hasn't shown the best technique, but he still won. 
And I think sometimes he just plays with people, you know, like uh, there's a famous match that he had with, uh, oh, they call him the Bruce Lee of arm wrestling, uh, a guy called Angerbaev, uh, Kurtigali Angerbaev. He's, they, they had a match in the top eight, great match. Kurtigali is like 220 pound guy from Kazakhstan, uh, brilliant technician, but power wise, you know, not in the same world. Mm -hmm. And Kurtigali did well, even though he lost six, nothing, mm -hmm. he still did well. Uh, but in my opinion, Levon didn't care. Levon was like grabbing him low and just like, whatever. Like, I will show him things that he's not seen before. I will. Um, he hasn't competed often in this rule set, which will be a challenge for him. But uh, yeah, what can I say? Like Levon, he's he's Everest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you are seen by... Basically, everybody is the big, big underdog. But you also, even even in the Eastern, even the, I mean, I talk to Russians a lot. Mm. There, you, uh, you know that moment in Rocky when they start cheering for yeah. Rocky? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're kind of the, they, they love you. They want you to win. And just, you know, it's not even, um, just the battle itself mm. is inspiring. And it's, it's, it's like the culmination in your career because- yeah. It, it's you know you're at the top for a long time but it's like it's almost like it should be over for you but no you're returning it's it is like this big moment yeah the big climb i will be the pointy end of the spear for north america <laughs> <laughs> yeah ah uh, beautiful well let's uh thanks for bringing that uh, match up Let, let's talk about just um the the, the match against uh, dennis your left hand match. Yeah. He's also terrifying and seen yeah. as one of the strongest, probably the uh one of, if not the strongest left hand arm wrestler. Yeah. Um there's a lot to be said there. Maybe you could talk about this match at a high yeah. level. Why did you yeah. take on this match? Why did you do the left hand yeah. versus the right hand? Yeah. What can you tell the story? Okay. Dennis the Plankoff. There's so much about this match. I love Dennis. Russian guy. Yeah, Russian guy. Russian, I used to call him Dennis Chernobyl. <laughs> uh, what a monster. He kind of uh, led, I'd say, this new era of arm wrestling where the super heavyweight strength level has just gone through the roof. I wanted the match for such a long time. We tried to get the match. Uh, we couldn't get it organized. This is back in like, you know, 2008 to 2012. Couldn't get the match, couldn't get the match. I've always been more of a one-on-one -on -one puller. He was doing the, uh, the tournament format. I was ranked number one in the world. And towards the end, it kind of was very undecided. I ended up getting surgery. I ended up abandoning the super heavyweight division. I went down to the 225s for a few years. WAL failed temporarily. Um, so the 225 pound division was scrapped and I said, okay, I'm going to go for the, for the big crown once again. And I started uh, to go after super heavyweights. The 2018 season was right hand. Uh, I started to enter negotiations to have the match with him. I, I, we'd been chasing the match for 10 years. They wanted to do it left hand. I wanted to do it right hand. I just wanted to, I just wanted to do the match. I wanted to do the match with Dennis. I wanted to meet Dennis. So people should know that you were, the right hand has always been your strongest. It has been, I mean, I had surgery in 2016. I hate to make excuses. I hate to do it. Um, Dennis was better than me that day, even on my best day. If you had gone back my entire career, at no single day do I beat Dennis Zaplankoff in 2018. I would like to think that I could maybe do it now, but at that point, there would be no version that could have beat him. I, I Left or right? Uh, right hand, no, I, I, I'm curious about the right. Uh, but left hand- So is the world. <laughs> well, it might still happen, it might, but- uh, Dennis completely destroyed me. Um, and I learned a lot from it. I I think before the Dennis match, I think I was, I don't know, I, I don't know exactly what your word to use. Maybe I felt like my thinking was a little bit elitist 
uh, and I really learned a lot. I was really humbled that day um, by how far and how professional and how prepared Dennis was uh, and how seriously he took the sport. There's a mental, a slightly terrifying calmness to him, which yeah. only comes with extreme preparation, I think. Yeah, his level of dedication uh, was extremely inspiring to me. Um, you know, I used to do a job where it was serious enough that the, the price could be death, right? And I arm wrestled throughout that entire period. And I always kind of looked at, uh, you know, the cost of doing an activity being death, uh, limited to soldiering. And I, I kind of changed my mind a lot after that match. I realized that anything that you're in love with, once you get far enough down the road and professional enough at it, it's gonna kill you. Like, doesn't matter what you're doing, if you're crazy enough about anything, it's probably gonna take your life from you in some way. Um, and that doesn't mean you rush towards death, it's just your level of investment and level of risk can have some catastrophic effects. Bukowski, Charles Bukowski, I think has the quote, uh, do what you love and let it kill you. Right. Something like that. Right. And I understood that Dennis's level of professionalism far exceeded mine in what we were doing at the time. And I realized that, you know, I, I was no longer employed. I was now in the world of professional arm wrestling. And I realized that, uh, you know, what was I doing? Like, how serious was I? So Dennis is an incredible guy. Is there moments in that match, there's just humility there too from him. Mm. It, that was a fascinating uh, sort of, it, it seemed like you realized that you just hit a wall and oh you were God. not ready enough for it. It was incredible. There was so many things that I remember about the Dennis match. I mean, I remember, you know, seeing video of somebody and then meeting them in person, it's different. I remember in the weigh-ins, sorry, not the weigh-ins, in the, the standoff that we did, you know, before the match, I'm looking at him, like I'm, I'm close, I'm looking at his arms and his bicep, it looked like an ass. Like it was like a freaking glute muscle. Yeah. Like his en entire structure was so sinewy and yeah. just so strong. I was like, wow, look, he's so physically so impressive. And, and um, I remember when I arm wrestled him a certain at a certain time, he allowed me to kind of set my position. You can very, you, you can't really tell because it happens very quickly, but he let me set my position, which means I kind of got my locks in where, where you can kind of really mm -hmm. do a great hold. And he just ripped through me. Just so you you were able to get this great I, position, yeah, so it was tore right through me. Yeah, and uh, it's the first time I ever thought that uh, you know he that I had torn something. I thought like after the match, I'm like, geez, did he rip my chest right in half? Like, um, what 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 did it? Uh, no, it, it, it was I think hundred percent. Yeah, just... no, I didn't. I didn't actually. Nothing went purple or anything, but. Um, yeah, the strength gap was very significant with Dennis. Uh, so could he, what would it take <laughs> to beat him on that day? Um, it, would, it would take me just being a little bit stronger um, more and, and, and more healthy, yeah. Uh, my left was not as healthy as it should be. Like I didn't have a full rounded technical arsenal it takes a time after surgery. It really does. Like, I mean, you can be good, but after a surgery like what I had, you know, you're probably looking at three or four years before you're starting to hit technical proficiency the way you should be. And uh, yeah, just a bit stronger. <laughs> How do you interpret the calmness on his face? Well, what is that about? Is he actually it's that very calm Russian, or is it isn't trained? It? It's a it's, Russian it's thing. It's a Russian thing, I think. I don't know. I see a lot of Russians like that. You know, they're so like stoic and... I'm such a fan of Russia. I, I really want to go to Moscow. I've been saying it forever. You've never been? Not yet. Not yet. I, I want to go. I want to just go and 
live there for like a month and just train. The, Moscow's got such a crazy arm wrestling scene. They've got, from what I understand, they just have so many clubs. There's so many strong athletes. Just go and just lightning rod. Yeah. Have you considered doing something of that sort? It's like Rocky Four again. Oh yeah. Like oh, and lead up it. to June. I would certainly consider it. I've got only one trip planned at the moment. Administration is very important. You what know, do you mean by administration? So like, like managing your time? And management, yeah. The management has to be very efficient. You know, when I'm a tourist, when I'm a visitor, a little bit of that goes down. You know, when I'm at my home and things are familiar, I've got a really great grasp on my time. You know, I, everything's in place. Everything's perfect. You know, if I could magically transport Moscow into my hometown and just go out and visit them, yeah. So it's very difficult when you're traveling, you have to keep all the, the you have to uh, figure out what you're eating, where, how you're getting the food, all the socializing, plus you're more and more a celebrity, so there's a social interaction, which I don't know um, how draining that could be on you outside of the arm wrestling table. So all you have to manage all of that because ultimately you have to focus on the fight ahead. Yeah, yeah. A lot of my strength comes from just being in a familiar place, doing my routine. I love to travel. I love to get out there and uh, meet people and new experiences. But when I just want to really prepare for a big match, yeah, home is uh, where I get strong. So that loss against Dennis was one of the few losses in your career. Uh, how did that feel in the moments after, in the days after, in the months after, in the years after, how has it changed you as an arm wrestler, as a human being? Well, it's tough to lose. Uh, Still haunt you? Um, I don't think so. I actually was really happy to lose to Dennis because, you know, sometimes when you lose a match, there's a lot of matches that I've lost where they upset me because I know I made a mistake. Yeah. I didn't make a mistake with Dennis. He was just, he was just way better. There's nothing I could have done that day. Uh, I'm really at peace with it. Um, Dennis, to me, was just a big inspiration. I think that me arm wrestling Dennis left-handed that day just let me touch probably one of the strongest human beings on the arm wrestling table that's ever lived, you know, left-handed. Um, so, so knowing that's possible is almost like, yeah. Uh, inspiration to you that I can be at that level too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seeing what Dennis did, uh, you know, just trying to absorb a little bit of his knowledge, uh, planted seeds in me. Yeah, I mean, when I look at my career, it's it's a bit like the stock market, but for sure I'm trending upwards. And since really kind of wrapping my mind around uh, some of the Russian philosophies, they really changed my training systems. Uh, there was some base philosophies that they talked to me about over there that massively impacted my training. Is it possible to convert some of those philosophies into words? Can you describe oh, yeah. some of the ideas oh, yeah. they taught you? So never smile. <laughs> ah, right? <laughs> Man, there's so like it takes a while to break the ice with a lot of these guys. Uh well once you do, I mean yeah. that's this deep as bonds you can form there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that I was raised under, I believe it's a flawed, It's. I mean, it's not flawed because it has its value as well, um, but it's best if you understand both philosophies. Uh, I think a North American thing that's just so ingrained in our fitness society is no pain, no gain, you know, and just pushing and like sweating and going harder and like fighting through like and grit and tough and but and then you talk to the russians and they're like yeah never fail you never fail never never go to failure uh always feel good always feel good it should always feel good don't um and those two philosophies express themselves very differently um and if you want to get strong yeah don't fail don't fail. So vo that's how you, they also are believers of volume. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of strategies, but yeah, volume is a massive principle. And volume is very hard to achieve when you're 
believing in no pain, no gain, right? right? They don't really go together. No pain, no gain, more injuries. So the is there parallels? Because in, in wrestling, some of the greatest wrestlers of all time are Russian. And they, they were big, um, Dan Gable talks about it, they were big on play. Right. Like lighter wrestling. Right. Because pr probably ultimately, actually, it boils down to that's how you achieve higher volume. Right. Like over the stretch right. of years, the way to reduce injury. Um, I, I mean, in wrestling also technique might um, have greater value than it does in arm wrestling. Obviously, technique is extremely important in arm wrestling, mm. but power is like can yeah. defeat technique, it, it can, seems like. Yeah. In wrestling, you can get away. There's a lot of ways you can really uh, uh, do sneak attacks, sort of use leverage on those kinds of things. So there's even more incentive to do play and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But uh, do you do you see the parallels between the two worlds? Oh, yeah. Like wrestling and arm wrestling? 100%. Well, you saw what I did the other night, right? So I'm playing on the table for hours, Yeah. right? So that's 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 my number one training thing that I do, is I go on the table for hours and I play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, when you did, uh, Sergey, can you pull up that video? It's on Devin's channel, the, uh, the water tank one. Oh, it's like 180p. It's like <laughs> the, the, the Wi-Fi in there was so bad. Yeah, it's great. I love it. It's, yeah. but it's uh, maybe the, the I don't know if it was fisheye, but it had a fisheye feel. It was yeah, crowded. I mean, so much camaraderie. It was it was amazing. Yeah. But maybe uh, just a brief mention of uh, Dmitry, the uh, the yeah. Russian, yeah. the Russian guy. What uh, uh, what in that play? What are some memorable things here? Like when you, when you go against a bunch of different people, mm -hmm. a bunch of strangers, yeah. what are all the differences and how do you grow from them? How do you learn from them? Well, everybody's a bit different. So I love to go to new clubs because the energy's always high. Like the first time you go to a club, everybody's trying to kill you. Yeah. Yeah. So they're there's gonna, excitement yeah. and there's this, and so you feed off of that. Yeah, you do. You can, you can, if you're able to be strong enough to absorb it without injury, it's it's awesome. It's awesome. Um, Cause they're giving you everything they can. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. So it's it's very specific, right? Like I'm gonna get way stronger at arm wrestling. And, and what I try and do when I go to these places is I make an assumption. I make an assumption that I'm the best guy there. And so I'll arm wrestle in a way that kind of protects them. Mm -hmm. Cause the more I can protect them and kind of keep them kind of in a good position, mm -hmm. they can actually give me more, mm -hmm. right? So I kind of I kind of give them little pieces that I think will put them in a place that they can really give me more. And so, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And then it, when I see somebody like Dimitri, yeah. I pull that in a little bit, yeah. right? <laughs> so, okay, so I know Dimitri's the number one guy in Texas. Uh, you know, lots of respect to the guy. I, I won't give him all the pieces until I really kind of gauge where he's at because I certainly in training don't want to fail. I don't want that. I don't want to, when, when you fail in arm wrestling, it's just imagine it's just bad technique and you're trying and bad technique, you're going to get hurt. Yeah. So you always want to be in a strong position here. What about in, how does how does endurance come into play here? And here's video yeah. of you strapping up with that's uh, right. Dimitri. Yeah. How, how do you? I mean, you went for like I don't know two hours. Uh, yeah, exhausted. it was long. So the first th this first run of the video I think was a little over an hour. And then I took a break and I probably did another forty five minutes or so. But I mean, do you? How can, are you okay with the endurance aspect of this? Yeah, that's probably like when you talk to the arm wrestling world, that's probably what I'm best known for is is my endurance. So this uh, helps build that. It does, but that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it to get strong. Um, in my opinion, this is this is one of the best ways to get strong, especially far away from a, from a tournament uh, or, or any kind of an event. Uh, I wouldn't want to do this, you know, even a month or even six weeks or even maybe even eight weeks before a big event. I'd want to already be kind of shrinking my volume, but far away from an event, yeah, as much volume as your body can handle and you'll feel it, you'll feel it. Like I felt it at times, like, you know, after the hour mark, I'm like, okay, I can feel my blood sugar kind of diminishing. I can feel like the blood that's going to my muscles is kind of like, 
it's not really pushing more good stuff in, it's start, I'm starting to break down. Mm -hmm. And you don't want that. You don't want that. Quick pause, bathroom break? I'm good, I'm okay. good. Okay, I kind of need one. <laughs> yeah, I'll maybe get a sweater, it's a bit. Is it cold? Do you, does that matter, does that care for chemical no, continuity? No, 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 and I still love the idea of you going to Russia. Yeah. And uh, training there. Yeah. I'm also making a trip out to Russia. Oh yeah, when? For, for different reasons. Well, it's hard with the current conflict. Uh, oh yeah. The tension's there, but I'm hoping uh, before your match actually, so May, Good. for a couple of interviews with a couple of folks, some of which people know. Maybe I could ask you about, uh, to comment on some matches that stand out to you in in your in your career, sure. Is there something? Uh, is there a particular? I've, I have a bunch that I really enjoy, but is there something that stands out to you as as uh, as memorable? We talked about sort of uh, a defining loss, perhaps to Dennis. Mm -hmm. Then um, you you faced Michael Todd, like we mentioned, uh, John. Brzezank, you've, you've faced uh, Matt. Mm. Um, is there something that stands out to you that uh, technically or psychologically you've learned a lot from? I've, I, mean, I feel like I, I try and learn something from every match, but there is a very special match to me that to this day, I can't explain. Uh, very weird phenomena. Uh, so I think it was 2005 uh, was my first uh, combat tour overseas. So it was a, a active tour, uh, you know, among, among other things, I, I got shot during that tour. Like we got blown a long tour, rough tour. And I trained the whole time through knowing that at the end of this, I was going to have a big match. So there's a champion a guy called Ron Bath. Uh, he's kind of, if there was no John Brzezink, there would be Ron Bath. Okay, so extremely decorated, unbelievable arm wrestler from the United States. And this is kind of when I was just kind of coming up in the sport still. I was fairly well established. I was definitely the best guy in Canada. And I had been for a few years, but I hadn't really expanded internationally too much. So I had a one-on-one -on -one match with Ron Bath and that's the one extremely hard fought battle it was three, one, I think three, one, but every match was really close and he won the first one. And I had to kind of like dig my way out of the trenches and, uh, ended up coming back and winning, but it was a match that was probably, it was probably one of my closest matches ever. And Dude, it was, it seems like there's frustration on you. What, what is that? What was going through your mind here? With these, uh, was it first of all going in? Did you think you could beat him? What was the level of confidence? <laughs> I always think I can win. Like I always <laughs> sure. do. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of respect to the guy. Um, but yeah, I mean, I always think I can do it. Uh, so how did what what lessons did you take away from it? Uh, why why is it so meaningful to you? Well, it's what happened afterwards. So I had some kind of a release afterwards. And that was the strange thing to me. So match ended and I felt like so relaxed afterwards, so calm, so, uh, so, you know, satisfied because it was one of those matches, uh, that kind of takes everything from you, yeah. but you win it. And I was relaxing in the chair and, uh, I've never had the sensation before, I've never had it afterwards, but it's like the center of my backbone just exploded. And it was like, ah, so weird, right? Cause I'm not really spiritual that much or religious even, but it's like a fire just ripped through me. And it only lasted an instant, just exploded through my whole body, out, 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 out the top, through my feet, and then it was gone, that was it. Uh, weirdest thing I've ever felt in my entire life. Um, yeah, but it was it was as a result of uh, what happened in the match and leading up to it, I had some kind of a release. Um, so what it does, uh, it almost, how did you interpret it psychologically? Was it like, uh, 
some kind of, I mean, not to be spiritual or whatever, but some kind of superpower that was uh, like, like a lingering feeling like, holy shit, I, there, you know. I can't, I can't explain it. And I haven't really tried hard enough to try to. Um, but something changed. Something happened there, yeah. Something happened to me. I was sore for about three or four months afterwards. It's like it smoked out my entire body. Yeah, that whole summer I was kind of sore. And uh, yeah, and then after that, like two or three years later, that's when I, I won the world championships. Um, yeah, I mean, all the matches are, you know, you get something from people. Like, you know, you study them, you you take something from them. People have an invisible crown and uh, he had one. And I think I took it from him. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that was the feeling of yeah. wearing the crown. Yeah, maybe. What about all the trash talk? How much of that did you learn? Does that come naturally to you? You're you're one of the most charismatic, fun. I mean, there's always like respect behind it. I would say to me, and I'm a fan of a lot of sports, you're one of the greatest trash talkers in all of sports that I've ever seen because you're able to talk shit but there's so much love and respect behind it. Mm. It's just masterful. But you also get into people's heads yeah. in the moment. It's beautiful to watch because it, it really gets it gets to some people. So where does that come from? It's a powerful weapon, right? Yeah. It's the, your voice is a powerful, powerful weapon. And it's underutilized by so many athletes because they think that it's not sportsmanlike or something like that. But the truth is, I mean, you can be a, a weak person, but with your voice, you can influence and change any number of things. And the same thing happens in a, in a, in a fight between two people. If you can just be a never ending, you know, flow of negative encouragement to someone or, you know, you know, suggestion, uh, anything can happen. It's a tool. Um, and when you're fighting a person, you're not just fighting them. You're fighting everyone who's watching. You're fighting the crowd, the referees, and you know, to get in the most ideal positions, situations, you need to use your voice. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a, uh, for people who haven't seen, I, I definitely recommend you watch a bunch of arm wrestling matches because um, there's a crowd really gets into it and it feels, it feels like there's a really intimate connection with the crowd. I suppose because the crowd is allowed to be very close to you. Yeah, so, <laughs> I love it. I, I, I want the crowd like right up on me. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Mark, oh, so you know, who are yeah. you, when you, whenever you talk yeah. to somebody, you literally pick somebody from the crowd. Oh yeah. Just... <laughs> oh yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll fuck him. Like I'll start fucking off his fans and like, yeah, like I'll, start talking to their wives or whatever <laughs> yeah yeah uh yeah there's jody um she's pretty dangerous to to listen to also but yeah one of his buddies mike stellaris who's you know really good arm wrestler was yeah. was talking was was cheering for him so i started to go after him yeah yeah smiling uh, the whole time. yeah it's Offering. fun right it's uh, fun it's, it's yeah fan it's fun to listen to but it's also what's fun is how much it actually affects some of the people you're facing they get yeah. frustrated yeah it's great to see well you have to fight right like uh, a lot of people think things will be given to them and and the thing that you know i've, I've always believed from the time i was very young like uh i i, I was convinced that uh our inevitable death was going to come from aliens right <laughs> like some super aggressive super violent species was going to come and smoke us all you know and i'm like I'm I'm not like that. I'm like, but as soon as one person is, then you're forced to have to accept it as reality, right? So I like to fight for every single thing. I like to try and be more and more aggressive. And if someone matches me, that's when I can use my endurance. And if they don't, then I have the tactical advantage. So that's kind of my, my balance point. And then, by the way, you also yell at the ref. Yeah, I mean the games. There's like <laughs> levels to this game, but you know the, the feeling sometimes when people get frustrated is like, okay, this person's cheating, or like mm -hmm. you're trying to get a good grip uh, before the go before it goes, 
and 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 I think some of the frustration in combination with the trash talk is well, this person is cheating, right? But everybody is like kind of trying to cheat, get Everyone, get an edge yeah, within course. the rules. Yeah. <laughs> so I try and just ramp it, ramp it, yeah. ramp it. But uh, you know, everybody's different. I've learned how to play the game based off of the tools that I have physically. Yeah. And for me, this works because, you know, my genetic makeup is more, I'm more of a, a persistence hunter, right? So like I need to extend things and that works well for me. Um, you know, if, if I was ex more explosive, I I'm, I'm probably wouldn't have the same strategies, yeah. By the way, for people who wa who are watching, uh, you're wearing a No Limits hoodie, which is yeah. Uh, yeah. one of your nicknames. I uh, I don't wash this thing too much. It's my bacterial shield to uh, <laughs> to the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, awesome. So you mentioned Jody. She's often in uh, in your corner and uh, does perhaps more trash talking than even you. Yeah. So I mean, if we could step away, she's an incredible human being. Is is sort of as a fan, it's fun to watch the two of you, both when you're arm wrestling and just as, as people, you just see so much, I don't know, kindness and love radiating from the two of you whenever you're trash talking or talking about just uh, random things or just talking about life. It's just a beautiful thing to watch. And thank you for sharing that with the world. But maybe can you, um, she paid me, to ask you this, but <laughs> what, 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 what are the things you love about Jody, your wife, Jody Larratt? What, what are the ways she has affected your life? Yeah. Jody and I go way back, right? We were in high school together. Um, the thing that I admire most in people is, is bravery. Uh, it's, to me, it's the most admirable quality. And Jody always has inspired me because she's such a fighter. You know, if if she believes that something's true, um, she will, she just she does not back down. She will she will not. And you can and not to say that she's can't change her mind because she can. But while she is convicted, she will uh, she'll not stop fighting. She's pulled me out of the fire repeatedly. <laughs> we've we've lived through so many things. Um, very lucky. How has she made you a better arm wrestler? She's fed me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I could see your uh, you have videos of your house basically coming apart when she's yeah. not there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Without Jody, I'm on the street uh, living in a tent and uh, yeah, down e by the e river. eating dog food. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, bravery. Yeah. What about love? How has love made you stronger? Now we're gonna make uh, Devin uncomfortable. Love is difficult to accept. Love is one of those things that, um, you know, a lot of times you don't feel worthy of it, you know? And so it's hard sometimes to accept someone's love. And someone who really loves you, yeah, they'll love you even when you don't, you know? And here you go, you're gonna make me cry, Lex. Uh, yeah, Jody and I have been through so much. Um, and she's shown me how, you know, she supported me just repeatedly, repeatedly. Some of that is loyalty and patience yeah. and perseverance and yeah. all those things. That's like when love really shows itself. Yeah. It's like sticking through yeah. together for years, even when you're through the, the shitty times. Love and faith are powerful forces in this universe. You know, without them, the, we can descend into darkness very quickly. You know, as a world, even between people. You know, when love and faith is destroyed, then then we fall apart. You know, and I've I've been graced by by the love that Jody's given me. You know, it's it's allowed me to continue to build. You know, when you have love between people, then you build together. Um, I love, I love my family. I love Canada. I love the arm wrestling community. I have a love for what we're trying to achieve as a human species. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know, when when that when that falls apart, we don't have much. But yeah, <laughs> just with my boy there. Yeah, yeah. She, um, 
you also mentioned you were uh, in a, you once had a job where uh, your death was a real possibility. Mm. So you were in the Canadian Special Forces. What did you take away from that experience, that time yeah. in your life? It was such a, such a great life. Really, really loved it. I honestly, I never, I never wanted to leave. I never thought I would leave. I thought I'd be there my whole life. Um, real honor to to get to serve. What What did you get to do? What What was the things you loved, craftsmanship wise? Like fun things you get to mm -hmm. do, yeah. learn and challenge yourself. Yeah, and and you mentioned sort of honor. Yeah, in terms of the 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 serving part. Yeah. Yeah, my favorite thing about serving in the special forces was for sure the people that I worked with. That's probably the first thing I could say. Uh, you know, I never, I always felt like totally comfortable and and putting my life in the other guy's hands. Um, I, I was so happy to be in a place where I felt I could follow. Um, like, it didn't matter. Like, I knew that the people ahead of me were were incredible. I knew the people beside me were incredible. So just having that faith in your team is very special. And to know that they're for there for a reason that has nothing to do with money, you know, there and that's what kind of brings everybody together is you're there to for a higher purpose. Uh and in terms of being an adrenaline junkie, <laughs> there's nothing like it. I mean, there's nothing like, you know, going out at night and fighting. Uh and when I say fighting, like my whole life I wanted to fight. Uh, and to me, there's a lot of, there, and, and look at, I, I've said this in the past and I think it's been a personal failure of mine because I've said things like, it's the highest level that you can do. And I don't believe that to be true anymore. But at the time, uh, I thought it was the best way I could express um, my drives that I had, you know, to be a fighter. Um, so, oh, so your sense in the past and maybe in part now is that sort of fighting is when humans get a chance to express themselves deeply. Like a, like that that mix of um, the bravery, the integrity, the... Um, yeah. Whatever that is that makes us human, that human right. spirit can really shine. And I don't believe that anymore. I believe that you can do that in any field in any discipline, you know, if you go hard enough, it all kind of starts to feel the same. Um, but at the time, uh, that, you know, expression to me was really, really awesome. I, I loved, I loved close quarter battle. That was my favorite thing. That's really the whole reason I was there. Uh, Can you describe close quarter battle? Close quarter battle is, is team fighting. So, and it can look a lot of different ways, but basically it's, ground troops doing some kind of a mission. And it's the orchestrated movement that is the skill, the orchestrated movement and the, the drills done quickly and accurately. It's, it's, it's very difficult With to do. communication? With communication. Yeah, so, oh, yeah. so you're, you're, it's basically cooperating together, Absolutely. communicating, yeah. there's some strategy, yeah. there's some adapting to the, yeah. the changing the, environment. And the more the team works together, the less communication there is, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's an amazing thing to do, to be part of a machine, well, machine, a team of people who can fight together like that. It's, I think it's, it's uh, we're really designed to do it. Like as good as we can fight as individuals, the thing that makes us really good is our ability to fight as, as a team. Yeah. Yeah, we're, that's one of the things that makes us really human is that collective intelligence, yeah. the social aspect. And yeah. uh, fighting is, the highest of stakes. So like yeah. that social interaction under the highest of stakes is uh, re really does bring out something that's deeply human. Um, I mean, war in general brings out something deeply human. It's it just, it's, it's, I mean, obvious to say that it's tragic that it results in so much loss of life and well being. Uh, let me, if it's okay, for a brief moment to take us back to um, arm wrestling. We, we we did this like offline. We talked about, you gave me some advice and about arm wrestling, but maybe do a high level overview of um, like the different styles and strategies 
that we've talked about. We talked about the importance of strength and power, but is there like offensive, defensive styles? Is there, we mentioned King's move. Uh, what 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 would you classify your style as? It's it's nice for people that don't know, maybe even zoom back out. So arm wrestling mm. is a sport yeah. where two people have to, uh, when we talk about strictly the sport, put their elbow on a particular pad means they have to keep that elbow on that pad and they uh, win when the back of one of their hands crosses some kind of, or basically touches the table. That's it. And uh, when you actually lock up, you do so, depending on the organization, without straps, meaning there's just you, agree, it's like mutual agreement that you're going to uh, uh, clasp your hands in in a way that's fair, and there's a referee that helps ensure that it's fair. But of course, there's these little games going on, and then when you actually go all out with this battle, if there's no straps, you can slip out. And so often you'll put the straps, which means you're uh, it's like marriage. Yeah, you're committed. <laughs> yeah, uh, for like somebody will have to lose essentially. Uh, there's no pulling out. So, th okay, so that's sort of the battle. Within that, what are the different styles that you can speak to that people that don't know arm wrestling could uh, could could Yeah, uh, could we can understand. start to kind of just dance around the subject yeah. a bit. I'd say there's a lot of different types. There's specialists, and there's kind of blenders and people who are very versatile. Um, a lot of guys win world championships on one singular move. They get just extremely crisp at, say, a hook or a top roll. And their style is very kind of focused. And you'll see it with a lot of athletes, like kind of a talk guy, boat guy who's very active, a guy called Jerry Cataret. Okay, as soon as you think Jerry Cataret, he's got a very unique style. He's got a flop wrist press. Okay, so most of his technique is built around this one system. Flop wrist means you're, yes. uh, what it sounds like. Yeah. So your wrist is flopped, so yeah. it looks but you're, like but you're, you're losing. Pushing. So he is pushing from a losing position. No, he will be offensive. So he will be in a press, so offensively. So he'll give his hand away so that he can get his shoulder behind it properly. So he doesn't, wow. Right. So you can press, press means Put like push, push, yeah, uh, yeah, without having that hook position, right? Which is what most people are always looking for, and Jerry's looking for it as well. And then, so example, there's another one. There's another specialist, Matt Mask. Yeah, he's a top roller, right? Uh, he basically that's his that's his great move, the top roll, and his other weapons aren't nearly as powerful. This incredible top roll. And then you have a lot of athletes that are more blended, okay? They have a lot of good options. Um, I think that I probably fall more into that category. You have people who are more speed guys, okay? So they try and do very little, uh, I'd call it attrition, right? So a lot of people are very willing to trade energy, mm -hmm. right? Because they have faith that their, their gas tank or their pool eventually will tire the other person out. So anytime there's a trade, they'll trade. Whereas, you know, a guy like Travis Bajan, you know, he was very, very well known as being extremely explosive, right? But if the match stops, typically he's gonna lose, right? So based off of your genetics, your hand, you know, there's a lot of ways to skin it. So I think you said uh, something like you're at, uh, 20 second guy. <laughs> That's right. I'm a 20 second guy. Yeah. So what are we what are the seconds we're talking about? So a lot of the power people they want to win in the first maybe 5 seconds like even really, shorter. Just that first that, push, that yes. first press that yeah, Absolutely. And that's right, it. Right to the pad. Yeah. And and so you're trying to hold off that attack. Yeah. If I beat you in a second, we're not in the same world. Yeah. yeah. Um when I'm with my peer group I will typically win 20 seconds and beyond. That's a typical win for me when I'm with a peer. Um, whereas other guys, when they're with their peers, they'll win in a second, right? That's how they do it. That's that's the way they're built. That's the way they, they train. 
um yeah most guys at a higher level it all starts to kind of it starts to get more and more difficult to be a specialist at the high level now some people just have little holes in their games um it's rare to get someone who can really do all the moves it's very rare what um uh, where would you put levon uh, I would not say he's a specialist. I'd say his top roll is his strongest move. Top roll. Top roll is his strongest move, yeah. Uh, and and the, the interesting thing about the, the specialist versus the blender, there's a counter, right? Every move has a move that theoretically should be the right choice. Mm -hmm. So if you're a single move guy, uh, there's gonna be a guy out there who'll get you. Yeah, it'll be very difficult for you to beat that guy. Um, but like when you come to like a tournament, typically specialists do much better in tournament scenarios because their singular move can get them through a tournament very quickly and efficiently. Whereas you get a blender in a tournament, they typically will have longer and more difficult matches. And by the right, yeah, yeah. But in, in, in super match format, typically blenders do better so we uh offline also talked about arm sumo or uh freedom arm wrestling i yeah. don't know how you want to call it oh i but, love freedom but, well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly north american way uh <laughs> so what so this is this is this idea and i, I watched a few videos and it looks fun yeah. it's basically removing the restriction of having to keep your elbow on the pad and just being able to arm wrestle over the whole yeah. table. Yeah. Uh, I think you've mentioned that the criticism that gets is it might be injury prone or something like that. Yeah. So can you describe this arm sumo freedom arm wrestling idea? Right. When you come to freedom arm wrestling, basically it removes the limitation of a standard arm wrestling table. Yeah. Right. So basically every single thing is a freedom arm wrestling table. Some are better than others, right? So looking for that nice table where we can kind of stand apart from each other and we're anatomically, you know, in a fairly safe position. Mm -hmm. And the rules in freedom, the way you win is like the knuckles must either touch the tabletop mm -hmm. or you hold it off the edge for a, for a three count. Right, so this is the main way to win. Yes, you can foul, like if you lift your elbow up, it's still a foul, but you have the entire playing surface. So your elbow is no longer limited to your seven by seven or seven by nine pad. So you can move it all over the table. You can move your body around the table a bit too. And if it's a big table, your body could yeah. largely be on the table. Yeah, so it basically it's like adjusting your ring size. So arm wrestling, you're fighting in a phone booth. Yeah. Right. So you get, you're fighting in a field. You're fighting. You know, just bigger. So it just yeah. it just makes the sport bigger. Yeah. This is Japan. But, but even on a small table, there, the, 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 even in a slightly larger phone booth, you can get a a lot more fun and variety. Way it's very more. Interesting to I watch. love it. I think it makes the sport bigger. I actually believe that it's the future of the sport. I really do. Because um, it makes it more accessible. Like you don't need the equipment. You right. can do it at a bar. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, less less equipment requirements. Uh, kids, most kids start freedom. Like most kids arm wrestle on school desks. Yeah. Yeah, and like if you see a guy on the street, you're like whatever, like you can arm wrestle anywhere. You don't need to bring your table around with you. If uh, we talked about the elite level, if somebody was interested in starting in arm wrestling yeah. or like going from just like, you know, I, you go to the gym, you mm -hmm. kind of lift, You've arm wrestled a few times, trying to get better at it, yeah. trying to learn. How, how would you advise like getting better to where you can beat your closest buddies? Yeah. That first step. First step, I'd say find people. Find people, find good people. Uh, it's volume. Get, we'll get with a club, get with people who know what they're doing, who can mentor you. And that's really cool. I, I got to meet, I realized there's a club in Austin. Yeah. I'm sure there's in a lot of places. Oh, they're everywhere. Uh, we, we got this, app called armbet mm -hmm. yeah which is a app that helps you find other yeah. people there yeah very awesome. easy but i mean they're all over social networks i mean it's kind of widespread now but yeah find people find people and it's just much easier to learn with another person and you'll get stronger that way but i mean do this do the lifts 
I mean, if you go to the gym, just start doing the lifts. Uh, and right away, those will technically prepare you. What are, what are the lifts? Can we describe? Yeah, so I, I'd say if you wanna just keep it very, very simple. Let's just talk about three. There's more, there's much more than three, but like when you talk about energy allocation, these three lifts, in my opinion, should be like 90% of your investment. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very big, these three lifts. Uh, and the exact percentages can, you can argue about it, but we'll, we'll, we'll start off with the cupping of the wrist. Mm -hmm. Just this, it's a simple thing. And do it with a cable, uh, you know, you can get a thicker diameter. So it kind of, you know, is, is more out on your fingers where an armrest is going to attack you, right? Because any good armrest is going to attack your fingers. So like open hand. No, no. Well, I mean, for health, yes, you could, but like, if you want to be really specific, you train exactly the way you would at a table yeah. in the position that you actually start Got the match. It. Yeah. And then you're just doing the, uh, this kind of. Yes. To your center. You're, people, this. people, one of the, one of the big misconceptions in arm wrestling is that you're aiming for that pin pad. Right. No. The, 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 the chest up Bring here. Bring it close to you. Got it. Make it come close to you, right? You see, like whenever I do my exercises, the, the vector is always pulling straight towards me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So just, uh, you know, cupping close to you. The most dangerous thing that a person can do to me on an arm wrestling match is just pull me away from my body. That that's a terrible thing for me, mm -hmm. yeah. So so that cupping, yeah, that's a massive part of the sport. Uh, so now, when you think, what does the cup do to the other person? If I cup, they get turned over, mm -hmm. right? So this has to get really strong. This pronation. So so, so to fight the yes. to to fight that rolling exactly. Yeah. So that's. That's through the thumb. Yeah. The th oh, so you put, uh, got it. You right. put on the thumb and you yeah. put this motion. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And those two things, those two things together, this cupping and rolling, this is what's going to make the person's hand bend back. And once the person's hand is bent back, their just their whole game gets cut to pieces. Got it. They have very little good options. It's all like nasty stuff. Wow. Uh, yeah. So those two things, that's a that's a huge part of of your of your investment. Uh, rise. Always be climbing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, those three simple things. That's what I would tell anybody to spend most of their time on if you want to become an arm wrestler. So and so use bands would be good for this. Bands are great because they're easy to transport. Uh, the only problem I have with bands is like if you like to measure. You know, and if you like to be precise, bands just aren't that precise. Right, to, to, to have growth. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I mean, it's just like, you know, you know exactly what you need. The prescription is kind of, a band is kind of like, and a lot of people, myself included, I like to, um, I like to know exactly my outputs. So, so weights. So uh, it, would, it would be like cables? Yep. Cables are nice. Bands are great too. I, I, I mix the two. Bands are uh, when I kind of don't need to, they're more like easy for me. I, when I train bands, I, bands are dangerous because the acceleration is so high on them. Like when you screw up with band training, the acceleration is way faster than gravity, right? So mm -hmm. if you do something bad, it can, it can make it go really much worse. Yeah. It's funny that you didn't mention bicep curls or, uh, well, it's a chain. It's changed. And so you're, I mean, the idea, if you focus on these three, the other stuff catches up, like it's all involved. This whole, this whole thing is involved. So if you have an ax, right? The blade of the ax, that's, that's these things, right? Like you need the, the pointy end of all your attacks to be awesome. Right. If you have a super sharp ax, yeah. you could have a shitty hand. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right yeah so focus on that the, the point the yeah tip of the axe yeah the tip of the axe is so important right like if i have an awesome bicep and i can't quite use it what's it good for right yeah i think a lot of the motions with the wrist that you mentioned are uh just thinking about jujitsu especially in the gi yeah um there's a lot of i mean there's so much importance to this and people don't often work it um explicitly 
Yeah. But so many of the chokes require yeah. ability to, it's almost like exactly like arm wrestling. Very close. Because you're weak here, uh, what's that called, flop wrist. Yeah. And you're strong with the cup, yeah. The, yeah. And so you, just getting the muscle, the, whatever that's involved, the muscle, the turning, the pressure, because that's where also the choke comes. That little, the thing that makes you win in arm wrestling is also the thing that finishes the person when you have some, them grabbed. The strength is very similar. Yeah, yeah. it's fascinating actually. Yeah. Of course, like you said, if you want to be very good, you should be doing the very specific very exact specific. motion. Yeah, but so if I was gonna do jujitsu, I'd be like working out with the gi. Yeah, the problem is, you know, uh, it's difficult to construct the um, the exact, so you have to actually go with people and then they don't like being choked on, <laughs> right? So like, it's hard to, I'm actually a big, we have these kinds of debates all the time is, um, you know, I'm a big believer in drilling. I love doing something thousands of times. Like John Donahue, somebody I, I mentioned to you about, the jujitsu folks here, they're less believers in drilling. They they see the value of um, almost like the mind of, of of going live and exploring ideas. It's that play. You don't need to do the thing a thousand times. You just need to always be thinking about the little details that make you uh, make you better. And then in action, practicing, like developing the strength, the power, the explosive of the agility in action. So yeah. actually rolling. I don't, you know, I, I, I agree with this, but I just believe in volume more. Yeah, so you can accomplish it through volume. You can you can play a lot. Yes, exactly. Well, that's the, if you really want to get it good as you're talking about, I mean, that's why uh, a lot of these folks are training three times a day. They're doing, you know, they're putting in the hours, yeah. eight hours, nine hours, yeah. just, just. Well, that's tough, oh my God. Well, so there are a lot of them are not doing going hard. It's just being right. on the mat. Some of it is just sitting there talking through ideas, yep. watching others or teaching, explaining stuff. It's just, it's like, it's not like, just physical. Uh, it's it's uh, mental too, because you're keeping in your mind. And some of the greatest, this what they talk about the, the wrestlers I've talked with, the fighters, at the top of their career, they basically, uh, George St. Pierre is like this, another fellow Canadian, is uh, he, like he has stick figures in his head that he can't help. Yeah, They're like in there, because if you train enough hours, you're, it's just gonna be in your head and they're all going to be playing around in your head. Yeah. And some little detail over time, it's almost like computing or something like yeah. that, and that yeah. ends up, uh, having a result, even though you're not physically doing anything, it's 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 always in there. Yeah. Yeah. I do have to return to diet real quick. I know we talk about yeah, pancakes. Right. Let me, quite seriously, um, you are one of the, I mean, strongest athletes in the world for your sport. So you have to get big. You have to get powerful. You have to get strong. What is the right diet for you for that like what do you eat how often do you eat yeah um yeah from the the highest detail to the smallest or the things that make you happy and feel good yeah uh, i've experimented with every diet i've done it all i've been a vegan uh i've done raw uh i've eaten only meat uh i've eaten balanced i've eaten like a bodybuilder uh you know you name it, I've, I've probably tried it. Um, I don't believe that it's as important in the sport of arm wrestling as it is perhaps in other sports. Uh, I believe that, I mean, just to be very basic, I mean, if you're eating enough food, you're probably gonna be okay. Um, so it's just calories. It's a lot, I mean, it, it really, I mean, not to overcomplicate it, but I mean, that's, that's where the conversation starts. Are you eating enough food? Um, and it can come in any number of ways. And I, I, I don't think it's as important as a lot of other people do. Uh, <laughs> I'm certainly irresponsible in a lot, but the thing is, is back to like volume, right? Like yeah. you need to, like, if, if you want to be a super heavyweight, yeah. it's very different than if you want to be a weight category guy. Yeah. If you want to be a weight category guy, I'd say that you need to be more responsible, make better choices. 
If you want to be a super heavyweight, <laughs> everything. Just so we're watching a delicious looking omelet. So eggs, yeah. bacon, syrup. So you don't care carbs or protein. So in all the things you try. So I mostly eat meat now. Yeah. And I landed on that. There's several things, you know, obviously I'm not, but I do a lot of sport. Yeah. And I was very surprised how my particular very specific body can perform uh, better with only meat. Why better? The sports I do, the mind matters. And so for some reason, my mind is just clear. Yeah. And I, I don't think, because it feels unhealthy. Mm -hmm. It just makes me feel really good. I don't think I would recommend it to anybody else. So it's, it's interesting that that journey of just exploring can take you to figure out something about your own self. One of the most interesting things that I heard about nutrition was I heard there was a actually put Doritos. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about yeah, 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 yeah. I'm an idiot. <laughs> uh, now I do. I'd say over the last couple of years, I've really gone into the into carbs a lot and high glycemic carbs, and you know, just to I, I feel like it's one of the best things you can do if you're working out really hard. Just cheers. Add carb. Yeah, exactly. Um, but oh, where was I? So so you've added <laughs> distracted syrup is for, I forget so everything. Delicious, it's distracting. Yeah. No, the, so you've added uh, the high glycemic car carbs into the mix. So that you those help, but that's for mass building, right? So there was a study that I heard about by somebody who's trying to identify heart attacks. They did this great big study, and at the end of it, I mean, didn't matter what the people ate. the The most important thing was how they felt about the food that they were eating. Mm. Yeah. So if you believe in the food, if you believe that it's going to do good things for you, and if you allocate it the right way, it's it's going to have a positive impact. And, and I try and do that no matter what it is. Like I have my foods that I think do certain things. And so, uh, you know, for me, I know that actually, I mean, I learned about corn fed pumps when I was overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, I realized that if I, I never used to eat crap, really didn't. I ate super clean all the time. And when I was faced with imminent death more, I would be like, okay, I'm going out tonight. Let's have, let's have a couple ice cream bars, <laughs> you know, like whatever. And what I realized is if I eat like an entire bag of chips or like, you know, a bunch of chocolate bars, and then I go and have a workout, my workout will be incredible. It'll be incredible. Um, there's something about easily processed carbohydrate that will continue to quickly get into your blood as fast as you can burn it. And there's something about that that uh, well, it gives you incredible blood, blood flow, yeah. And also your mind plugging in, enjoying that. Right. And then believing it works. And that's not how it right. makes it work better. Exactly. I mean, I, I feel that way. I think this is really not, this has been frustrating to me about the health culture in the United States in the studies that are done. You know, you look at like the, the importance of sleep, the importance of X diet, all those kinds of things. I, I wish incorporated into that would be your mental relationship with all yeah. of these things. So for example, people that tell me, well, your sleep schedule is insane. Yes, perhaps, but also it's insane because I'm doing what I love and I don't see it as a problem. Right. And I I think that's really important to understand if if you if you're if you sleeping crazy hours uh is not affecting your stress and is actually making you happy or you're drawing some kind of source of happiness and pleasure and satisfaction, like being awake when others aren't. It's like the Mike Tyson thing or something, like training when you, you've you convinced yourself everybody's sleeping and therefore yeah. you're somehow training much better. Right. That's powerful even if you look statistically six hours may be worse than eight hours or four hours may be worse than six hours. So the mind is a powerful thing. Super powerful. But if you want to be a super heavyweight. Eat. <laughs> you got to eat like stupid amounts all the time. Yeah. You have to test your digestive system. What's your favorite meal, by the way? Just if you had to, you know, <sighs> you the know, last meal. I am, 
uh i do oh geez i like so much food it's tough but i'd say the food that i rely on a lot when i'm uh getting ready to compete is sushi just because it normally comes in an all you can eat format <laughs> you know uh so you know i love to go and just binge all you can eat just all you can eat sushi. buffets sushi is just super convenient yeah, yeah. Uh, if I was a sushi, all you can eat buffet place, I'd be terrified when I saw you. Uh, <laughs> have you had barbecue at Texas? I nope. yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, so you uh, just a small tangent on this. You you uh, face the mountain. Uh, oh yeah. Have for uh, uh, Bjorn. Well, first of all, you arm wrestled them. Yeah. It's interesting to ask. Um, so this is the mountain from the Game of Thrones. Uh, a strong man, one of the strongest people in the world for a time, the strongest person in the world. Mm. What was it like? I know sort of you guys maybe weren't going 1,000%, but what's it like? Well, he probably wasn't going 1,000%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like what, it's interesting to think, what does that strength feel like? So it's a, it's a specialized strength in another sport. Yeah. What did it feel like? What, how strong was he? What are some kind of deep insights you drawn from that battle? I feel like, if we were to go back a thousand years and if you give him armor yeah. and a two-handed sword, he will just rip across the landscape <laughs> and, and no one will stop him. So this is the boxing match you tune into, but there's also a video of them arm wrestling. Yeah, see. what a titan though. What yeah. a titan. Uh, you know, a, a guy like that, tall, yeah, strong, fit, disciplined. I mean, he is, uh, he's quite a warrior. 419 uh, pounds. Uh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's incredibly impressive. Uh, I, I really like Hap Thor and I like Eddie Hall too. Mm -hmm. And I was just so, I'm, I'm just so caught up with the drama. Okay, so, <laughs> so Eddie Hall and Hap Thor Bjornsson, yes. two of the strongest legendary strong men that we have uh, at, at, you know, and they were the coolest they were the top when Strongman was really super cool. Uh, I don't know all the details, but they legit hit each other. <laughs> like le legit. Good. So yeah. I think it kind of stems, I, I don't know, like, like I say, I'm not right there with them, but uh, Eddie won the, the World's Strongest Man event or something one year. And like, and the thing, it was one of those victories where Hapthor, you know, was not accepting of his defeat, mm -hmm. okay? And there was a little bit of back and forth. And basically, from what I understand, they were gonna fight like the night of the world's strongest man. And they got kind of got pulled apart and this, uh, this heat between them got translated into a potential boxing match. So it's very real. It's a very real fight. So you have the two strongest dudes on the planet are gonna fight each other. <laughs> So, so I've been like, you know, cause arm wrestling and strong, man, it's, it's kind of similar communities. Um, who, who do you got? If you, if you were giving me financial advice. And oh, on Jesus. The fight. I am so bad. I always call it wrong. They're very different. Uh, I, I see, uh, Hap Thor as being, you know, more. Well, Eddie Hall is slimming down. Is that what? Yeah. That is? Wow. I see Hap Thor as a bit more regimented. Um, but I see Eddie Hall as like way more barbaric and like, a little, I think he's a little bit more athletic, mm -hmm. but Hap Thor is bigger and, uh, and you know, they've chosen slightly different paths to prepare for the match. But, but what happened was like, they were about to fight and Eddie, Eddie Hall blew his bicep. Mm. So me, I was getting ready for Levon in December. We were supposed to arm wrestle in December, but he's got his movie. And so I was like, okay, I can kind of get away from the sport just a little bit, mm -hmm. broaden my base. That happened. And I was like, oh, an opportunity. You stepped in. An opportunity to fight. I'm like, I'll do it. So how much training you, uh, you, you, you trained a little bit. So can you tell about yeah. your own decision to do that? What was the training like? What was the yeah. experience like? Oh, it was so much fun. It was so much fun. Uh, so basically I made a funny video and I sent it to the, organizers of core sports that I, I would do it. I'm like, I'll do it. I'm sure they got a thousand people who wanted to do it. Uh, but I'm like, I'm like, listen, I'm like, I, I'm an old man. Like I'm gimped up like everywhere outside the arm wrestling lanes. Uh, I said, but, but I will 100%. Like if you let me fight them, I'll, I'll give it my all. And, uh, 
and whatever they didn't get back to me they're like yeah whatever okay so then so then they call me on a friday like five weeks before the event and they're like hey devin were you serious and i'm like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, yes, I was serious. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And they're like, okay. Um, they're like, it's down to you and like two other people. Uh, we'll get back to you in a, in a day or two, but you would do it. And I'm like, okay. So they got back to me on Sunday. <laughs> like, so right away I'm like skipping rope and I'm like, and I'm so, I only arm wrestle legs. That's all I do. So what was your, you did some yeah, uh, so, striking training. Yeah, so I went to, um, this guy that he was he was awesome Zach Ben Bushida there uh, that was it from from TriStar mm -hmm. do you know Faraz Sahabi mm -hmm. uh, and that's and, and yes people in the comments I will interview him on this podcast people <laughs> he's brilliant <laughs> yes he right is brilliant. he's an incredible guy so right away like I had no idea about the fight community across Canada really and I got like by the fifth message that said you must train with Faraz. Uh, I was like, okay, called him up. He was incredible right away. He's like, yeah, you can come and we'll just work with you. So I got I got the call. I called him on like Monday at two o'clock. By like seven o'clock, I had my things packed and I went to Montreal and I spent four weeks in, in the fighter dorms. Just it, humbling yourself. Yeah, every day, just getting punched in the face, you know? Uh, over and over, uh, going for runs with all, like they're all like Olympians and pro fighters living in the dorms. Super cool dudes. They were so good to me. Yeah, there's a good video of you and uh, Faraz uh, just talking. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't remember which stage this was, but this basically- This is early. But you were already beginning to get humbled. Oh man, I knew. I mean, I knew what I was getting into. Like yeah. I knew it was, I knew it was going to be a losing battle. But I felt like the opportunity to fight Thor. Like yeah. how cool is that? Like I had, to, I, I had to say, I had to do it. Um, I love the process, and I learned a lot from doing it. Like the dorms, I want to do something like that with arm wrestling. I think we're big enough now that we can have these kind of uh, you know, dorms, frat houses, whatever you want to call it. So what's the dorm like? So you're basically staying there. Yeah. The food right. is there. Yeah. So you can, you can, you mentioned, uh, what was the word you used? Administration? No. Yeah, um, exactly. That's it. So it removes all of that. Makes it so simple. You can just focus. You know, the gym is here. You live here. Yeah. You know, that your life becomes simple. Yeah. So there's a guy named Jimmy Pedro here in America. He's a famous uh, coach. There's a place up in Boston. He has kind of a dorm like that too. Yeah. And it that, that becomes essential when the community is small, but you're trying to do epic things right. like win an Olympic gold. Yeah. So you have to really put the people yeah. together in these kind of minimalist conditions mm -hmm. where they just focus on the training, focus, yes. focus, focus. Yes. Um, yeah. It wasn't enough time. I mean, I trained yeah. for about well, yes. three or four weeks. <laughs> Uh, but I, I love the journey and uh, well, what are some of the fun things you enjoy? So you did mostly striking, did you? Uh, yeah, I guess it was. Yeah, it was boxing. It was straight up boxing. Boxing, yeah. What well, What are some things that were transferable? What are some cool things you learned from that? So, so from the world of armor, have you taken anything back? Like some training regimens, ideas about training, even just mo even even movements? Because for us, is a yeah. unique mind as well for training. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I've gone very far down the path of arm wrestling. Uh, boxing and arm wrestling are very different. They're they're very different sports. Uh, the the physicality required is very different. Uh, you know, the mentality. I mean, it's fighting, so it's another form of fighting, which is cool. The the big things that I took back from it, the things that I loved about it was. I had to run again, you mm -hmm. know? I, so really work on endurance. Yeah, yeah. I was going for runs with guys in the dorms and they'd, they would just destroy me. Just like, it was so bad. Uh, so did you, uh, like, how did you feel in the actual boxing in terms of endurance? Oh, Were you able to? No, <laughs> no. It's just torture. It was, it was terrible. I, and, and, and the thing is, is, it was so crazy for me because I really was good once upon a time. Yeah. I really was like physically, like I had incredible full body endurance, you know, 
Um, but you know, being so specialized, I realized how much I had slipped. Yeah. And yeah, it was it was fun to try and regain. I think it's affected my body composition. I think since that training, I've become much more lean. Mm. Uh, I think it was a very healthy thing for me to do, like health wise. Like I always think that you know, when you're far away from competition, it's really good to kind of spread out. Really yeah. good. So I think that in that way, also for your mind. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Just like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so something about clearing your. I, I think you've talked about this as like uh, you're basically taking steps back before you take steps forward. It's, uh, I forget how you call yeah, it. Yeah, the but, wave. Yeah. Yeah. Under, you know, you have to go under. Yeah. You, you got to. You know, if, if you want to go above the line, you have to spend some time beneath it. And yeah, I was definitely beneath the line for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Mountain, I mean, like the interesting thing was as incredible as he is, uh, you know, like what a monster. And I think if you had had him training in boxing, you know, for a long time and, and like from his youth, I think he, you know, the guy could be world champion, uh, but, you know, to be so specialized and then to switch, you're at a disadvantage. Yeah. And, and also like, I know from just fighting guys in the gym in TriStar, <laughs> some of those guys were way scarier. <laughs> for real like as scary as thor is like there's guys in that tri-star gym that don't look like anything yeah. that would murder me much worse <laughs> much worse yeah but also you know that's the difference between being in the gym and under the lights too i mean uh gsb is an example george st pierre is an example of somebody that maybe doesn't look yeah terrifying he's but at a tri-star yep he's he trains a tri-star but he's quite he's super nice Super uh, humble, but is terrifying when he's fighting. Right. Is dominating people. Mm -hmm. You mentioned death. Yeah. And your Canadian special forces and in, in general thinking about mortality. Yeah. Do you think about your death? Do you, yeah. do you contemplate the, the end that this thing, that this ride ends? All the time. Yeah. From, uh, I, I've thought about death from a young age. Are you afraid of it? Yeah, I hate it. Yeah, I don't want to <laughs> die. Yeah, definitely, definitely don't want to die. Um, but there's times when I can rid myself of it. Yeah, but for sure, I mean, I, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not happy that you know death is inevitable, and I'm not happy that potentially it's inevitable for all of us. Um, but uh, it does, you know, I like to to fight against it. Does it, yeah, would you, if you if you could be immortal, would you, would you oh, choose to? Oh, that's my only wish. Oh, see, but here's the thing. That's but the point is to have that wish. It's uh, it's like the all you can eat buffet at uh, sushi. It's that sushi is more delicious if you have a limit. It, do you have a? Oh well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I I don't think I get sick of stuff. I'm very simple. Yeah, I don't think I would get tired of it. I really don't. Um, I mean, if someone would pose it to you. Do you want to live forever? You would choose no? Yeah, I would choose no. Choose no. Well, my answer is probably yes. Uh, like, no, I would, uh, it's more like s the snooze button. Do you want to, do you, do you, well, do you, you want to go to sleep? But it's very difficult in the moment to go to sleep. But if, if I'm uh, allowed to live forever, I'm going to uh, delay all the crazy, like um, all the ambitious goals, all the, all the things, because oh, there's always time. That's fine, but there is tomorrow then. But there is tomorrow. Yeah. But see, I think that takes away from the richness of like the richness of the lived experience of just each moment. I think the richness of each moment comes from saying like, I could die tonight. Like that, that it yeah. tastes delicious because yes. you're going to die. I'm, af I'm afraid if, if you're not, I'm afraid all of that goes away. All of that magic goes away if you can live forever. Mm, I, don't <laughs> I don't know. But I'll tell you, <laughs> every time argument. I have a near-death experience or think I'm gonna die, yeah. I definitely live better afterwards. Yeah. Like, uh, it's always been that way. But yeah, no. Um, That's why the Stoics, you know, they really preach contemplating your mortality often. It kind of oh, yeah. reminds you, it could, this whole thing could just end any moment. And it makes you really appreciate, 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Certainly improving the quality of life is important. But um, part of me thinks that immortality is, is not as fun as um, we would like to imagine. Do you think that maybe you're, uh, I mean, what you're building potentially is immortal? Well, that's what I definitely th think about with robots. If they were to have a human-like experience and be able to interact with humans in a deep, meaningful way, I think they too have to be mortal in some fundamental way that means mortal. Like their ride has to end as well because they won't be able to interact with humans deeply unless that's the case. Um, like to have, to have fear, to have love, the ability to suffer, the ability to miss somebody, I think scarcity is important. You have to be able to truly lose somebody. You have to be, to, to fear things, you have to truly have the risk of destroying yourself. And to have a sense of what it means to be a self, you have to be able to lose it. <laughs> so if you're immortal, you're just going to be, I feel like you're going to be like a toaster, an intelligent toaster that just serves. Such a negative perspective on it. On you immortality? Just, yeah, just think, well, now you just, you can get all those things done that you wanna do. I hope you're right, I hope you're right. Yeah, I, I mean, potentially you could invest even harder because you're like, wow, I'm actually gonna be able to get all this stuff done. I, I think about this a lot. I, I hope you're right, but I, I fear that the drive to create, I can even do more, all of that dissipates, disappears if you have all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. I just know how lazy I am. And if I have all the time in the world, I'm just gonna sit there and just like watch the stupidest YouTube videos for the rest of all eternity. Uh, now <laughs> eternity is a long time. Eat Doritos, yeah. and Cheetos, and just yeah. get fatter and fatter. I can get in shape later. There's always yeah. time. That's <laughs> like a long period of contemplation. Yeah. <laughs> so you know? for the first thousand years, yeah. it'll be the Dorito period sure. of of the Lex life. And then yeah. <laughs> You could you could be like Jabba the Hutt for a thousand years. You mentioned aliens, very important topic. Do you actually think about uh, about this? There's been an increased uh, interest, and there's been uh, increased UFO sightings and encounters, all that kind of stuff. The U.S. government, at least, releasing data, um, release releasing videos of uh, pilots uh, pilot observations and from airplanes of UFOs. Do you think about this kind of stuff? Because you met, you mentioned in the following context, you mentioned like our humans will get our shit together when the aliens eventually come. Yeah. Um, what do you make of all the sightings? Is that something you think about? I thought about it a lot when I was younger. Um, and I've just, I made my conclusions and yeah, I, I, I don't think that there's a possibility that there aren't aliens. I would think there would be impossible for there not to be aliens. Uh, they're, you know, um, you know, I, I feel like this is pretty good real estate. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, you'd probably want it, but we already might be, well I, well, I don't even think might. I mean, it's probably quite likely that we are to some degree aliens. I mean, all life is probably to some degree alien. I like the real estate, so the resources, but we're also kind of interesting. Yeah. Whatever this ant colony of living organisms that we've created, it's kind of interesting to study. I, I tend to believe that the alien civilizations that are, going to reach us or have reached us are far more intelligent, just orders of magnitude more intelligent than us. And so it's going to be very difficult both ways actually for us to understand them and for them to dumb themselves down enough to understand us. Yeah, probably. So they might even just miss our existence altogether just because we're. I tend to believe, I don't know what you think, that we're not that special in terms of all the life forms in the universe. There's a lot of cool stuff out there. And- uh, Has to be, has to be. But to us, we're special. Yeah, well, that's all that matters, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even the, the human species is the most special to, the, to us humans. There could be much more special species here on earth they were just totally oblivious to, like trees on the scale of thousands of years. Maybe they're like, they're, they're onto something. 
<laughs> Lex, you know, um, I think that so much of what makes a person special is what they pass on, your kids. But, but I think that you are quite special because right. you're part of this thing that's potentially giving birth to the next thing. The robots. The robots. I, I should say, the funny thing is, while talking to Devin during this podcast, I, I would a door, doorbell ring, I had to go downstairs, and there was a big box, <laughs> menacing box with a new legged robot. So um, the hilarity of you saying that is, because that, that, that robot is actually going to likely be the main robot that I show to the, to the world in, in the coming months, because that has the, that's the highest compute level in that robot. So I've, I've been playing a lot with legged robots, the um, four legs, mm. so like a like a dog. Um, I like I like all robots, but there's something about when a robot has legs, it's able to communicate, it's able to connect with humans in some kind of deep way, in the way a dog can, mm. just show affection. Something about like step, 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 and then and then the robot realizes you're here, and then it steps and then notices you in the way the dog does and yeah. raises its head. Um, it makes me feel noticed and heard in the same way I do when a dog notices me. That excitement, that stupid excitement of like, yeah. yes, uh, fellow living organism. And what excites me about legged robots is that, holy shit, it's possible to engineer this. It's possible to create that feeling. And I wonder where that can go. There's a lot of negative possible trajectories, uh, but I have a sense that there's positive ones too. You, you Add think more that love they'll to the take world. us with them? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Because I, I de so th there's this fear of robots that they become super intelligent and run away from us humans and basically become so intelligent and then they almost just not giving a damn will destroy us. Uh, but I think in order for for robots to become intelligence, they have to integrate themselves with society. So they they by the very nature of, of how they become intelligent have to bring us along. So th it's not that there'll be this separate thing. They have to, like we'll have robots in the home, well, they'll be interacting with us. You have human kids and you have a bunch of robots, you have robot friends, you have human friends. And they the robots make your human to human relationships much more meaningful and richer. They bring more love to the world, but they it's integrated. It's not like they'll be developing smarter and smarter um, as like um, sentient beings by themselves. I think that's very difficult to do. You have to be doing that together with humans. And so we'll come for the ride. There's technical things like we might merge like cyborgs mm. more and more. Well, we already saw our cyborgs, right? With the phones yeah. and so on, but more and more. So with Elon and Neuralink, deeper integration of ro robots and AI into our, like d increasing the bandwidth at which they can communicate. Right. So if we do implants in the brain, I think, um, again, a lot of people are really nervous about this. Uh, as am I, but I think there's a lot of trajectories that are positive there. And that to me is exciting. And, and also I just don't think it's possible to stop this development. So we should uh, steer it. Yeah, yeah. For good. Did you, I mean, you must have watched the movie Terminator, right? Yeah, of course, I yeah. love Terminator. <laughs> yeah. I love my, Schwarzenegger. My favorite movie of all time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's that's the big fear, right? Yeah, what's the conclusion with Terminator? Isn't ultimately humanity wins? I, I think I they're know. at like Terminator Eight now. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah, the so there, and, and it's interesting. Actually, I was going to bring this up as you were talking about it, but uh, but China and the United States I actually don't know where Canada is on this, but they both have agreed that they're not going to put limits on autonomous weapon. Uh, system development. They're so not going to. They're not going to. Uh, so because China said we're not going to, and right. now U.S. officially yeah. announced that we're not. We can't. Because the, well, you can't. It's like it's you, you never could, right? As soon as it exists and it's better, people will use it. Well, but you, um, there's been a global ban on bioweapons. 
Mm. So you were able to come to an agreement there that we're not going to use biological weapons in war. So it was, it was a lot of people are really upset that in the case of AI-driven weapons, the world said, nope, that's okay. Mm. And so now you have this potential for greater and greater automation in drones, for example, and picking uh, bombing locations. Yeah. And so the area at which they attack. And so you get th some of that stuff that you mentioned that, that drew you to the military is that teamwork between humans, that decision-making. So there's strategy, but built into that team is a deep humanity. Like, yeah. even when there's an enemy, there's lines that you are aware of, of what is ethical and what is not, what is just and what is not. And it's so easy for a machine uh, to, uh, to miss all of that, yeah. plow through it and do deeply inhumane acts, commit atrocities. That mm. That's something that worries a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> Cause uh, yeah, an AI based war is just, is, 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 it's terrifying, yeah. especially with cybersecurity, which is becoming more and more of an issue, which is hacking. Yeah. Uh, sort of uh, people that look a lot like me, being the warriors of the future. <laughs> yeah. Which is meaning people behind uh, a, a keyboard versus uh, right. versus the traditional warriors. Probably inevitable. Yeah. And yeah. terrifying. It is, it is. But I think if you believe that it's possible, it's certainly gonna happen. Like at some point, it's just when, right? When does it happen? Anyway. So that, I mean, to me, I'm optimistic. Uh, ultimately optimistic about the future. And to me, I'm excited about the world with AI. I'm even excited about uh, the metaverse and all these kinds of things, yeah. living more and more in the digital space, in the virtual reality. I think, so it's a part of me that grew up in the non-internet world, non-computer world, you know, it says, oh, kids these days with their video games, you know, there's part of me that's like that. Um, but I think what's, it, when te technology at its best can bring out the best of humanity. And so I think virtual reality, all of these things over time, we'll figure out how to how to fix it to bring out the humanity. So social networks, the, the, the first generation social networks, now Facebook, Twitter, and so on, they have so many problems. They're bringing out the worst in people. But I think we're learning from that. And I think the next generation of social networks will be better and better and better. And so I'm optimistic, but of course, you know, one reason we may have not seen aliens yet, obviously, like in a way that's obvious, mm. is because once you get clever and smart and have all this cool technology, you destroy yourself. And we sure as humans are pretty close to that. Yeah, yeah, there might be that limit that is hard to get right. I'm hoping we get all our aggression between nations out through arm wrestling. Uh, competition <laughs> right <laughs> just all yeah, of that like, yeah uh, oh my god wouldn't that be great if that was if it was that simple yeah do you know if there's another over the top type movie to be made oh yeah yeah there's always stuff in the works um there's actually a there's a the, there's a tournament called over the top in australia that's a couple months away i think they're doing it all the over the top scene but uh there are arm wrestling movies that are being made right now actually i'm there's a documentary that's filming me yeah. for this whole Levon thing but um uh, yeah, we're probably due for another big one. Yeah. But you're also just with your YouTube channel, you're doing a lot for the sport. That's really cool to see. Just being genuine, but just being like uh looking not like you're looking today, but just like Yeah. Just yeah. the beard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I'm only a just mess. like sleepy, yeah, yeah. you know, and just putting yourself out there completely as you are. That's a beautiful thing. The best yeah. thing about the sport is it brings people together. That's it. Yeah. The community, the the folks I got to interact with just so awesome, so excited, so full of kindness. I'm definitely gonna find the club here and uh, and start working on my uh, on my arm wrestling game. Uh, Devin, this is such a huge honor that you would uh, spend your valuable time. You would come down to Austin. You would um, hang out with me and uh, do this conversation. Super cool to talk to you, Lex. Yeah. As I mentioned, uh, in case people, you know, people, I'm sure will tell me. So I hang out with Joe Rogan all the time. He's a friend. 
I told him that he should talk to Devin. He's going through some stuff currently, you know, uh, but I'm sure that I hope the conversation between you, Devin and Joe happens eventually. He's, uh, that would be epic as well. Cause he's a, um, yeah, he I loves fighting. He loves yeah. fighting. He loves wrestling. He loves strength. And uh, I think all of those are um, like so perfectly encapsulated in the sport of arm wrestling. So thank you so much for talking today, hey, brother. Thanks so much, Lex. <laughs> thanks for listening to this conversation with Devin Larratt. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now let me leave you with some words from Miyamoto Musashi. The only reason a warrior is alive is to fight. And the only reason a warrior fights is to win. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.